my dear Count. It's no doubt a traveller, perhaps even someone they are sending to help us. I don't want any help, growled the German. He leaned out again. The car was only two or three hundred yards behind. He said to one of his men, pointing to Lupin, Bind him. If he resists... He drew his revolver. Why should I resist, O gentle Teuton? chuckled Lupin. And he added, while they were fastening his hands, It is really curious to see how people take precautions when they need not, and don't when they ought to. What the devil do you care about that motor? Accomplices of mine? <laughs> what an idea! Without replying, the German gave orders to the driver. To the right. Slow down. Let them pass. If they slow down also, stop but to his great surprise the motor seemed, on the contrary, to increase its speed. It passed in front of the car like a whirlwind in a cloud of dust. Standing up at the back, leaning over the hood, which was lowered, was a man dressed in black. He raised his arm. Two shots rang out. The Count, who was blocking the hole of the left window, fell back into the car. Before even attending to him, the two men leapt upon Lupin and finished securing him. "'Jackasses! Blockheads!' shouted Lupin, shaking with rage. Let me go, on the contrary. There now, we're stopping. But go after him, you silly fools. Catch him up. It's the man in black, I tell you, the murderer. Oh, the idiots! They gagged him, then they attended to the Count. The wound did not appear to be serious and was soon dressed. But the patient, who was in a very excited state, had an attack of fever and became delirious. It was eight o'clock in the morning. They were in the open country, far from any village. The men had no information as to the exact object of the journey. Where were they to go? Whom were they to send to? They drew up the motor beside a wood and waited. The whole day went by in this way. It was evening before a squad of cavalry arrived, dispatched from Treves in search of the motor-car. Two hours later Lupin stepped out of the car, and still escorted by his two Germans, by the light of a lantern, climbed the steps of a staircase that led to a small room with iron-barred windows. Here he spent the night. The next morning an officer led him, through a courtyard filled with soldiers, to the centre of a long row of buildings that ran round the foot of a mound covered with monumental ruins. He was shown into a large, hastily furnished room. His visitor of two days back was sitting at a writing-table, reading newspapers and reports, which he marked with great strokes of red pencil. "'Leave us,' he said to the officer, and going up to Lupin, "'The papers.' The tone was no longer the same. It was now the harsh and imperious tone of the master who was at home and addressing an inferior. And such an inferior! A rogue, an adventurer of the worst type, before whom he had been obliged to humiliate himself. "'The papers,' he repeated. Lupin was not put out of countenance. He said quite calmly, "'They are in Velden's castle.' We are in the outbuildings of the castle. Those are the ruins of Veldens over there. The papers are in the ruins. Let us go to them. Show me the way. Lupin did not budge. Well? Well, sire, it is not as simple as you think. It takes some time to bring into play the elements which are needed to open that hiding place. How long do you want? Twenty-four hours. An angry movement, quickly suppressed. Oh, there is no question of that between us. Nothing was specified, neither that nor the little trip which your imperial majesty made me take in the charge of half a dozen of your bodyguard. I am to hand over the papers, that is all. And I am not to give you your liberty until you do hand over those papers. It is a question of confidence, sire. I should have considered myself quite as much bound to produce the papers if I had been free on leaving prison, and your imperial majesty may be sure that I should not have walked off with them. The only difference is that they would now be in your possession, for we have lost a day, sire, and a day in this business is a day too much. Only there it is, you should have had confidence. The emperor gazed with a certain amazement at that outcast, that vagabond, who seemed vexed that any one should doubt his word. He did not reply, but rang the bell. The officer on duty, he commanded. Count von Waldemar appeared, looking very white. Ah, it's you, Waldemar, so you're all right again at your service, sire. Take five men with you, the same men as you're sure of them. Don't leave this gentleman until tomorrow morning. He looked at his watch. Until tomorrow morning at ten o'clock. No, I will give him till twelve. You will go wherever he thinks fit to go. You will do whatever he tells you to do. In short, you are at his disposal. At twelve o'clock I will join you. 
if at the last stroke of twelve he has not handed me the bundle of letters, you will put him back in your car, and without losing a second, take him straight to the Santé prison. If he tries to escape, take your own course. He went out. Lupin helped himself to a cigar from the table, and threw himself into an easy chair. Good! I just love that way of going to work. It is frank and explicit. The Count had brought in his men. He said to Lupin, March! Lupin lit his cigar and did not move. Bind his hands, said the Count. And when the order was executed, he repeated, Now then, march! No! What do you mean by no? I'm wondering. About what? Where on earth that hiding-place can be? The Count gave a start, and Lupin chuckled. <laughs> For the best part of the story is that I have not the remotest idea where that famous hiding-place is, nor how to set about discovering it. What do you say to that, my dear Valdemar, eh? Funny, isn't it? Not the very remotest idea. End of chapter 11